From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Gary Cooper, Faye Ray, and Walter Connolly in The Prisoner of Shark Island. Lux presents Hollywood. To the thousands of loyal listeners who wouldn't miss a Monday night with us and who loyally purchase Lux Toilet Soap, our sincere thanks. Your continued patronage helps us to bring you these weekly performances. Tonight, the Lux Radio Theater welcomes to its audience here in Hollywood more than 40 of the country's leading radio editors. Our great cast this evening stars Gary Cooper, Faye Ray, Walter Connolly, John Carradine, and Ernest Whitman in The Prisoner of Shark Island. Our play is one of the most amazing chapters in American history, a story of the romance, the gripping drama, and the final pardon of a man condemned by fate to life imprisonment for a crime which authorities tell us he never committed. As special guest, you'll hear Mrs. Nettie Mudd Monroe, daughter of the man about whom this play was written. Louis Silvers conducts our orchestra. And now, here's our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. While tonight's play shares the scope, the drama, and the brilliant coloring of fiction, you'll find it much more than just a thrilling tale. It's based on the life story, the suffering and ultimate triumph of a real man, an heroic physician, Dr. Samuel A. Mudd, the prisoner of Shark Island. Many years have passed since history wrote the story of our play, but the final chapter in the life of Dr. Mudd may be read to this day in the drowsing little community of Bryanstown, Maryland. There in the venerable churchyard of St. Mary's Parish is a simple marker on a simple grave, which reads, Sacred to the memory of Dr. Samuel A. Mudd, died January 10, 1883, aged 49 years. But the memory of Dr. Mudd is perpetuated beyond that humble marker. It lives on and will live on as long as men read history. Our radio adaptation of this amazing biography, screened by 20th Century Fox Studios, is heightened by the presence of one of the world's most popular actors in the title role, Gary Cooper, whose two current hits are The Adventures of Marco Polo and Bluebeard's Eighth Wife. Outstanding in tonight's cast are four other Hollywood notables. Faye Ray returns to us in the role of Peggy, and Walter Connolly plays the part of Colonel Dyer. John Carradine as Sergeant Rankin and that splendid Negro actor, Ernest Whitman, as Buck, resume the same parts in which you saw them in the motion picture. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents The Prisoner of Shark Island, starring Gary Cooper. April 9, 1865, the great armies of the North and South put aside their arms, and the war between the states was over. The nation, war-torn and weary, went suddenly mad with joy and relief. A few nights later, President Abraham Lincoln attended a performance at Ford's Theater in Washington. Quietly rocking in the flag-draped stage box, he seemed to be enjoying the play. <laughs> a ripple of laughter comes from the audience, and then... I I can't make it, Harold. My leg is broken. The bone's ramming through the skin. But we've got to get across the Potomac. We won't be safe until we're in Virginia. I can't do it. I can't. Wait a moment. There's a boy coming along the road. Boy. Boy, come here. Yes, sir? Do you know any doctor living around here? A doctor? Oh, yeah, yes, I know one. Dr. Mudd, Dr. Samuel Mudd. He lives just a little piece around the bend. Oh. Uh, can I help you, boss? No. Go on about your business. Yes, get away. Yes, sir. We've got to get to that doctor. I'll help you, sir. We'll make it. Somehow. Sam. Sam. Sam, 
there. Somebody at the door. Oh, what's that? The door. Oh, I, I guess it's that stork looking for Aunt Rosabelle's cabin. I've been waiting up for him. <laughs> well, if the stork doesn't know his way to Aunt Rosabelle's, after 12 visits, he never will learn. <laughs> No, it's more likely that big lumbering husband of hers. Buck's all right. He's the best worker I've got on this plantation. All right, I'm coming. Just a minute. Uh, will you get my hat, Peggy? You'd better take a coat, too. It's chilly. Oh, are you Dr. Mudd? Yes, I am. This gentleman's... My friend's leg is broken. Can you, uh, can you do something for him? Oh. Well, uh, let's get him inside first. What happened? His horse threw him. Oh. Down on this chair. Mm. Easy. You you can uh, get my satchel in the hall. Peggy. Yes, Sam? Uh, get some hot water and towels, and you might bring some coffee, too. Oh. Wait a minute, friend. I'll get that boot off. Oh. I guess we'll have to cut it off. There we are. Too bad to have to split such a fine boot. Hurry, please. I've got to be going. Not on that leg. You've got a bad transverse fracture. If you're out in a week, you'll be lucky. A week? Well, you're mad. Just fix it, Doctor, the best you can. Well, I haven't any regular splints here, but uh, excuse me a minute. I think I can rake up a substitute. Hal, quick. Give me that boot. And that knife on the table. What are you going to do? My name's on the inside. I've got to scrape it out. There. That'll do it. This coffee's not very strong, but I hope it'll warm you up a little. Oh, uh, thank you. I never thought that anybody but doctors had to be out at this hour of the night. His, uh, his mother's dying over in Virginia. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Lucky I didn't throw that cigar about out yesterday. It'll make pretty fair temporary splints. Well, friend, I've got to set this leg. But I'm going to give you a strict, stiff drink of brandy first. Peggy, uh, uh, will you bring the brandy in from the dining room? Yes, Sam. And you might as well take that boot out with you. Wait. It's no good now, friend. No. No, it isn't. Will you hurry, please? I've got to go. I can't stay here all night. Now, now, don't be impatient. I know you're in pain. Let's see that leg. Uh, hmm. Where were you? Were you uh, coming down from Washington? No, from, uh, from Baltimore. I'd certainly like to have been at the White House last Monday when old Abe asked the band to play Dixie. I guess old Abe's all right after all. Looks to me like he might be the only salvation we Southerners can look for. Him and God's mercy. Here's the brandy, Sam. Good. Drink it down, sir. It'll help you bear the pain. Lean on me, sir. We'll make it all right. This is downright foolish trying to travel on that leg. I could put you up in the spare room. No, thanks. How much do I owe you? Well, uh, two dollars will about cover it. Here you are. Wait a minute. Let me fix you up a little prescription for you. By the way, I don't think you told me your name. The name doesn't matter. But I think I ought to know. I said the name doesn't matter. Very well. Take this. It's a sedative to ease the pain. Now get it filled as soon as you can. Thank you, Doctor. You've done me a great service, and I'm sorry if I seemed abrupt or rude. That's all right. And I appreciate how patient you've been, particularly at such an hour and under such conditions. Things like that can't matter to a doctor. The door's got to be open all the time, day or night, to anyone in trouble, no matter who he is. My hand, sir. And good night. Queer sort of, sort of a snake, wasn't he? How much did he give you? I didn't notice the bill. Let's see. Gosh, fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. No name. Oh. oh. Fifty dollars instead of two. The whole affair is queer. Oh, they've <laughs> discovered their mistake. They've come back. Uh, Master Sam. Well, hello, Buck. Master Sam, she's ready for you. Rosabelle, sure ready for you now. <laughs> the stork arriving at last, huh? All right, Buck. Let's go. Goodbye, Peggy. Goodbye, darling. It's going to be a lucky day after all. <laughs> Open up. Open up there. Oh, Yankees again. Sorry, sir, but is this Dr. Mudd's home? Yes, 
It is. Where's Dr. Mudd? He's out on a case. Who wants to know? Lieutenant Lovett, United States Army. And this is Sergeant Henderson, my aide. I am Dr. Mudd's father-in-law. Colonel Jeremiah Milford Dyer, 4th Virginia Cavalry, Confederate States Army, sir. Then maybe you can help us. We're looking for two men who passed through this part of Maryland last night. One of them was hurt, had a bad leg, broken, perhaps. Did you see or hear anything of them? I've seen or heard of no such men. Were you here last night? I live here. And nobody came or knocked? I've told you, sir. Nobody. Well, with your kind permission, Colonel, I'll go inside with you and wait for Dr. Mudd's return. You stay out here on the porch, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Howdy, little Johnny Reb. What's your name? Martha. Martha what? Martha Mudd. And this is my dolly, Samantha. Howdy, Samantha. What's that thing your dolly's in? <laughs> That's my dolly's carriage. <laughs> well, well. That's the first time I ever saw a boot used for a doll carriage. It's a nice one, but it's broke. Yeah? Say, where did you get this boot? Up behind the house. Mommy threw it out this morning. She said I could have it. She did, eh? Mister, where are you going with my boot? And if you insist on waiting, that's your business. But I... Lieutenant. What is it, Henderson? Lieutenant, take a look at this boot. Funny, ain't it? Hmm. Where'd you find it? Mud's daughter was hauling a doll around in it. Somebody's tried to scratch out the name inside of it. Looks that way, sir. The kid said her mother had thrown it out behind the house this morning. Good work, Henderson. I think this is all we need. Here's my son-in-law right now. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, nothing. Don't even speak to him. They gave they come busting into a man's house, asking a lot of dead, bloom, fool questions. Keep quiet, but... Grandpa. Are you Dr. Mudd? Yes. I'd like to ask you just one question. Did a man come here last night? Why, yes. Who was he? I, uh, I don't know. His leg was broken. Ever seen him before? No. Sergeant Henderson... Go and get Mrs. Mudd. Yes, sir. What is the meaning of all this? You can't even guess, I suppose. I can't. You'll be telling me next that you uh, never saw this slip boot before. Oh, that? Well, certainly Sam. I... Sam, what does this mean? What are these soldiers doing here? That's just what I've been trying to find out. Would you be good enough to tell us, Lieutenant? Certainly. I'm here on duty, and it isn't a pleasant duty. Dr. Mudd... You are under arrest for conspiracy in the assassination of President Lincoln. He was murdered in Ford's theater last night by the man you aided to escape. That man was John Wilkes Booth. The court is now in session. Mr. President, the Judge Advocate General, the death of John Wilkes Booth, who was shot down while resisting arrest in Virginia has left us eight members of his criminal band. So, in the name of the government of the United States, the crime of assassination and conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln is charged against the following. David E. Harold, George A. Atzerodt, Louis Payne, Michael O'Loughlin, Edward Spangler, Samuel Arnold, Mrs. Mary E. Surratt, and Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Dr. Mudd was a dyed-in-the-wool slaver. Dr. Mudd served in the Confederate Army. Dr. Mudd denied he'd ever seen Booth. Dr. Mudd's name was on the prescription, I feel. When I examined Dr. Mudd in prison, he confessed to me he'd set Booth's broken leg, and then aided him with directions how to reach the Potomac and Virginia. Wife and child are outside, Dr. Mudd. They're going to let me see them, General Ewing? Yes. As your counsel, I was able to arrange it, but you'll only have a few moments. Take me to them. Down this corridor. Sam. Oh, Sam, darling. Daddy. Peggy. Martha. <laughs> Don't, darling. Please. Daddy, are you all right? Yes, honey, I'm all right. <laughs> oh, Doctor, I'm going to wait outside. I'll call you when the time is up. <laughs> it's 
good to see you both. How are you, Peggy? I'm all right. Dad is here in Washington with us. And the uh, plantation? Oh, Buck and Rose Bell are looking after things. They've been so loyal, especially Buck. He'd do anything for you, Sam. You can count on Buck. Have you heard anything of the trial? Only what I've read in the papers. Sam, what are they going to do to you? I don't know. They can't find you guilty. They found the others guilty. But you only did what any doctor would have done. You didn't know who Booth was. You didn't even know that President Lincoln had been assassinated. They don't know that, Peggy. They believe the evidence. And the evidence is against me. They can't help themselves any more than I can. Something's got to be done. It's just like a nightmare. You, you can't fight. You can't run. You can't do anything. And all the time it's coming toward you, closer and closer. Dad! <laughs> we haven't given up yet. We're not through yet. No. Not yet. And I haven't said I'm guilty yet. I'm sorry, but you'll have to leave. Be brave, Peggy. It's got to come out all right. Are you coming with us, Daddy? No, not now, honey, but it won't be long, and we'll all be back together again. I pray for you every night. Goodbye, Peggy. Oh, Sam. <laughs> is dismissed. Gentlemen, you have heard these witnesses. You have heard what they swore under solemn oath. The case against Dr. Mudd is ended. The case is not ended. Uh, I beg your pardon. Prisoner will observe order. Why? What more can you do to me? What threat have you got left? You believe these witnesses because, because they told the truth as they saw it. Well, I'm telling the truth, too. Believe the evidence against me if you must, but ask yourselves in your hearts, was I a physician in the plot because it was part of John Wilkes Booth's plan to break his leg and to need me? Does an, assass Does an assassin confide his plans in anyone? Gentlemen, in the sight of the holy God I worship, I am innocent. You have heard the prisoner. The court will bring in its verdict. You have reached the verdict, gentlemen. We have, Mr. Secretary. What is your verdict? Imprisonment on the dry tortugas for life. have just heard Act One of The Prisoner of Shark Island. In a moment, we will continue with Act Two of our play with Gary Cooper and an all-star cast. During this brief intermission, I want you to turn with me for a moment to something in a whimsical vein, to just a bit of springtime nonsense. I find that there is a fad here in Hollywood. Imagine it, grown-ups writing parodies on favorite Mother Goose rhymes. I thought it might be fun to round up a few of our own studio poets. So I'll introduce to you now a young lady from our script department. Step up to the microphone, please, Miss Bennett. Now, uh, which one of the nursery rhymes have you parodied? Mistress Mary, quite contrary. All right, let's hear it. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, what makes your skin so sweet? I use Lux soap for beauty bath. I'm dainty from head to feet. Thank you, Miss Bennett. That was very nice. Now for our mother goose of the reception department. What's your name and what will your deathless words be about? Well, my name is Helen Crow. My verse is about Bo Peep. All right, give it to the world. Little Bo Peep fell fast asleep and dreamed of a bad complexion. But when the day dawned, she sat up and yawned. Lux toilet soap is my protection. Now, our next poet is a charming young lady who plays bit parts. Here she is, Miss Ransom. Well, Mr. Ruick, I've got to tell you something. You're going to think I came here under false pretenses. I haven't got a poem. You mean you came unprepared? You haven't got a poem? Yes, I'm afraid that's it. But I have got a riddle. A riddle? A riddle? Well, let's have it. The riddle is, what is it that's just like a poem, only there are no words to it? What is it that's just like a poem, but there are no words to it? Uh, I guess you'll have to tell us. Well, the answer is, when it's a captivating, devastating, enchanting, luxe toilet soap complexion. By Jove, you're right. 
A lovely complexion is like a poem. And with Lux Toilet Soap, it's easy to guard that complexion of yours. Truly, a beautiful skin does make men think of fresh spring blossoms. Lux Toilet Soap is the care nine out of ten famous screen stars use to guard their priceless complexions. Use it before you renew makeup, always before you go to bed at night. Let Lux Toilet Soap's active lather guard your complexion. Now, Mr. DeMille. Gary Cooper, Faye Ray, and Walter Connolly continue in The Prisoner of Shark Island with John Carradine and Ernest Whitman. Dr. Mudd was sentenced to imprisonment for life on the dry Tortugas. At Garden Key in the Gulf of Mexico, a federal prison ship has just discharged its motley cargo. In the white heat of the noonday sun, they march over the bridge and into the receiving yard of the prison. Corporal O'Toole, in charge of the detail, brings them to a halt and reports to Sergeant Rankin. 200 from Washington prison, Sergeant. Hardens, too. Got the commitment papers? Yes, sir. Let's have them. They all checked in? Yes, sir. Hmm. Samuel A. Mudd. Step forward, Mudd. Are you Samuel Mudd? Yes. Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Dr. Mudd, I've been waiting for you. So all they gave you was life, huh? Well, maybe this will make it a little harder. So they couldn't hang you, eh? Well, by Judas, you're going to wish they had before I'm through with you. Get up. Get up! Take a good look at him, the rest of you filthy hounds. Take a good look at one of the men who killed Abe Lincoln, the greatest man who ever lived. Look at him. Watch him get what's coming to him. That's all for you right now, Mud. Get back into line. Now, you rats... Before we go any further here, I want you to listen to me. Because I know exactly what every mother's son of you is thinking. You're figuring on whether you're going to be able to break out of here. Well, we've got a little way here of putting thoughts like that out of your head. Follow me. Hold Whenever you scum get to figuring on breaking out of here, I just want you to give a little thought to this moat you're looking at. You all see it? Speak up. Speak up! Uh, You can see it all right, can't you, Dr. Mudd? Yes. All right. It runs all the way around the island. It's 75 feet wide and 35 feet deep. You know what we keep in it? We keep pets in it. Nice little pets. O'Toole, throw a hunk of meat in the water. Yes, sir. Now watch. Close. See those black fins? Know what they are? Sharks. You don't see the meat anymore, do you? Well, that gives you a little idea of what would happen to any of you if you tried to swim that moat. How do you like that, Dr. Mudd? (laughs) Soldier? Yes, sir. Take Dr. Mudd over to the Sawbones for a physical examination. We'll check him in first, because Dr. Mudd is going to be our favorite here. Yes, sir. This way, you. All right. That's all, Mudd. Put your shirt back on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McIntyre, I'm also a physician. I know you are. I simply thought that, uh, well, as another physician, you would understand the evidence against me. The obligations of a doctor to give aid to anyone in pain and need, whoever he might be. Mr. Mudd, if you assumed you might find sympathy here, get rid of the idea. The profession you have dishonored is ashamed of you. Ashamed of your membership in it. As a doctor, I may inform you that I despise you even more than the rest of the world. It would be of no use for me to swear to you. On the honor of the profession we both love and respect, that I had no part whatsoever in the death of Mr. Lincoln... It would be of no use, whatever. I see. Very well, Doctor. Ma 
Marsa Sam. Who's that? It's me, Marsa Sam. It's Buck. Buck? What are you doing here? I was soldiering down here, Marsa Sam. Well, when did you get here? I've been here a month waiting for you, sir. They say they need big husky colored boys for soldiers, and they took me right off. But why? Well, why did you do it? Miss Mudd, she say, get down on that island, Buck. Get on there and look after Martha Sam. So here I is, sir. Buck, my wife, Martha, how are they? Well, they's all right, Martha Sam. Rosabelle and the colonel are taking care of them. God bless you, Buck. You've given me the first gleam of hope I've had since this, this nightmare started. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Buck, what's up? Does Mrs. Mudd think she can, can get me out of here? I don't know, Martha Sam. Miss Mudd and the colonel are fixing to do something... They wanted me down here. They're going to write to me when they're ready, and I'll give you the letter. It's all in Washington, now. There goes Taps, Master Sam. And I gotta go. But don't you worry. Me and the good Lord and Miss Mud and the Colonel gonna get you out of here, sure. I finally persuaded General Ewing to pay our Washington home a little visit. How do you do, General? My pleasure, madam. General Ewing, this is Judge Maven of the District Superior Court. Pleasure to make your acquaintance, Judge Maven. The judge is a Yankee, but honorable. Thank you, Colonel. The judge is going to get Sam out of jail, General. Uh, just a moment, Colonel. You're taking too much for granted. Do you have some kind of a plan, Judge Maven? Well, the plan is Mrs. Mudd. No judge would dare devise anything so... so extreme. Uh, General... I explained to Judge Maven what happened to the writ of habeas corpus you obtained for Sam. Well, of course, you understand Dr. Mudd is in a military prison. The uh, writ was useless. But if a writ were served on him in, say, uh, Key West, a civil municipality, it would be honored, wouldn't it? Of course, but Dr. Mudd is not in Key West. No, I know he isn't yet. But suppose, just suppose... That we could get him there. Great Scott, Mrs. Mudd, you surely wouldn't dare I'd to dare do such. anything for my husband. And it's not only freedom I want for him. It's exoneration, too. He's innocent. And they've got to say so to the entire world. Just a moment, Mrs. Mudd. General Ewing, all I have to say is this. If Dr. Mudd should be able to deliver himself to the civil authorities in Key West, I could have a writ of habeas corpus there to be served on him. Under its protection, he could then be brought back here. Yes. I would reopen the case and, with certain new evidence, prove his innocence beyond a doubt. But as to how Dr. Mudd is going to be able to get to Key West, I would rather not hear. Now I must bid you all good day. Good luck, Mrs. Mudd. And I won't be the only Yankee praying with oh, you. Oh, thank you, Judge. Oh, we'll sell everything, pawn everything, mortgage everything. We'll get enough money. Mrs. Mudd, please. You understand what this means to me, don't you, General Ewing? It's all that's left of our lives. Sam's and Martha's and, and mine. General, you can leave the escape entirely to me. Within 24 hours, I'll have 5,000 of my old brigade under my command. We'll seize a war vessel or two, blow the whole prison to dust again, and deliver Sam to Key West with a guard of honor. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mudd, but if you're set on such a foolhardy plan, I, I must withdraw from the case. But we've got to do it. He's got to be free, to be tried again. It's the only way, don't you see? I... Yes, but I'm sorry, but I cannot sanction such a plan. I can only believe that you're, you're not serious, that you're simply overwrought. Again, sir. Never mind, Dad. Mrs. Mudd, if you'll take my advice, you'll abandon this mad scheme. Goodbye to you both. Dad, what do you think? Yeah, Sugar, we'll show him. I'm sick and tired of this fiddling around. I'm a man of action again. We'll get Sam out of that prison and we'll raise enough money to do it. This sword here on the wall. Stonewall Jackson gave me this blade. Pure Toledo. This will be the starter to raise money to hire a ship. And if I don't get $150 for it, I'll have the pleasure of splitting the heart of the swine who dares to offer me less. 
soap with a key to your cell in it. Give me the letter. Quick. Yes, sir. Here it is. Can you see enough to read it? Yes, Buck. It's, it's from my wife. Yes, sir. I thought it was. Listen. We are now in Key West and everything is ready. If you can only get there. The boat we have hired will be anchored off the island. You will know it by its black sails and two riding lights at night. Master Sam, I see that boat today. She got black sails and she's anchored about half a mile out. Are you sure, Buck? Yes, sir. All right, Buck. I'm ready to go. To, tonight? Tonight. But uh, how about the mood? I'll have to try the bridge. Well, there's got a guard on it, Master Sam. Yeah. If I could go with you... Yes. I can arrange to be the guard that's on the bridge. That's it, Buck. You arrange to be on the bridge and we'll go together. Now, listen carefully. Tool. Who, uh, who is it? Sergeant Rankin, get up. Yes, sir. Uh, anything wrong, Sergeant? Do you know what post that boy Buck is on? Yes, sir, the bridge. He swapped it with another fellow. I thought so. I saw him around Mud Cell early in the evening. Take a detail out and relieve him. Then place him under arrest and bring him here. What's up? Our starboarder is out of his cell. Mud? Yes. Post extra guards at the bridge. Notify all sentries. We'll see if we can't give this Judas what the court martial should have given him. Go on. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dr. Mudbuck. Halt down there. Halt or I'll shoot. Halt. You get him, sentry? No, there he is on that ledge on the wall. Just above the moat. Hey, Judas, he must have over the moat. Find the bridge, man. Find him. There he is. He's down in the water. What's the matter with you fool? Can't let you hit him. He's swimming on the water. Keep shooting just the same. He'll never make it. If we don't get him, the sharks will. What sharks? Why, what sharks do you think, Dr. McIntyre? That barrage of bullets on the water, you're lucky if you've got a shark left in a hundred yards of that. Huh? He'll scuttle let him escape. There's the sharks. They're coming back. Don't fire, I tell you. Just even with the fish, they'll get him. I don't see him. Look, out yonder. There he is. Where? He's outside the moat, swimming out to sea. Why, Judas, he must have gotten through the drain pipe from the seawall. There's a schooner out there with two riding lights putting in toward him. They're going to pick him up. I'll fix that. Or two. Yes, Sergeant. Detail men for three eight-oared cutters and get them launched on the double. Yes, sir. I want that man back. And I want him back alive, understand? Alive. Man, two points off the starboard bow. It's Sam. Steady. Steady now. Grab him. Easy. There we are. Come. Dad. It's all right, son. You're safe now, Egad. Just put your arm over my shoulder and we'll go down into the cabin. Captain. Aye, sir. Head her back to Key West. Here he is, Peggy. Sam, my darling. Peggy. Oh. I, I was afraid I I couldn't make it. Oh, Sam, you're wounded. Lie down here on this bunk, son. It's nothing. A bullet nicked my arm. Eh? It's all arranged, darling. Everything. You're going to have a new trial. You'll be freed. And you're going to see Martha. Where is she? In Key West. She's waiting for you, darling. She she hasn't forgotten me. Oh, no. Not for one minute. What is that? It couldn't be from the fort. Egad, if it's the dead, blamed Yankees, I'll show them a thing or two. I'm going on deck. You stay here with Sam, Peggy. Yes. Stand by for the fort They can't take you back. They can't. They must have sent boats out after me. But how could a boat catch this schooner? We have sails. The fort has cutters. They can travel. 
Oh, but we've got to get away. We've got to. Safety and freedom are so near. You can't. They'll never take me back to that hellhole alive. Oh, Sam. The fire and stuff. What's happened out there? Oh, dear God, help us. Help us. Well, now, ain't that a touching little scene? Hiya, Judas. Rankin. Very flattering, Dr. Mudd. I didn't think you'd remember me being away so long. Who's that old man out there on deck? He... He's my father. You can't do anything to him. Not anymore, ma'am. He's dead. No. No! Yeah. And where Dr. Mudd's going now, he'll wish he was dead, too. for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We've completed the second act of The Prisoner of Shark Island. In this intermission, before Gary Cooper and our all-star cast return in Act Three, a remarkable privilege is ours. The tragic circumstances which gave us the story of tonight's play seem to belong to a dim and distant past. This is a new world, and for our reflections on the 1860s, we're accustomed to rely upon ancient records and books of history. Yet tonight... A human link binds us to the time and to the hero of our play. For with us in the Lux Radio Theater is the daughter of the prisoner of Shark Island. She is Mrs. Nettie Mud, Mud Monroe of Baltimore, Maryland. Better than any other person, she can tell us of that noble American who was her father. I'm honored to introduce the daughter of Dr. Samuel A. Mudd, who speaks to us from New York City, Mrs. Nettie Mud Monroe. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I wish to extend to the Lux Radio Theater both my gratitude and congratulations for devoting this splendid hour to my father's memory. I am amazed by your play, for with most exceptions, The Prisoner of Shark Island is proving to be a most accurate portrayal. In my possession are many letters which my father wrote to my mother from Fort Jefferson. They tell of how, upon his arrival there in 1865, he served for a time on the wharf, carrying the bricks. There is one letter I want to read to you that tells better than all others what my father was like. He says, I endure the severest privations, for the most part patiently, and can stand anything, my dear wife, but the thought of your dependent position, your ills and privations. This thought undoubtedly drove him to attempt his escape. He hoped to reach some spot where he could surrender and get a civil trial. He was certain that a civil court would prove his innocence. But, as the play points out, he was caught, chained hand and foot, and put in a dungeon. My father was mag had magnificent courage. He survived not only the ordeal of imprisonment, but the ordeal of being freed. As far as I know, my father never referred to his four years on the dry Tortugas, and my mother, too, was always silent on this subject. The world will never know what she felt. All of these details, I suppose, are best forgotten. For after all, justice did triumph. Furthermore, my father felt no malice. For if he had, the events that you will hear in the next act of your play could never have come to pass. Father's unfortunate life, strangely enough, taught me a very beautiful lesson. It made me realize that out of great suffering can come something glorious. Through injustice, the world becomes more just. Through cruelty, the world gains kindness. Through inhumanity, we find mercy. Thank you, Mr. DeMille for asking me to be a guest tonight in your Lux Radio Theater.
We're back now in Hollywood and send to you, Mrs. Monroe, our sincere gratitude. In a moment, Mr. DeMille raises the curtain on the third act of our play. But first, I would like to remind you that Lux Toilet Soap not only safeguards the complexions of the lovely screen stars and guards against unattractive skin, but that it makes a grand beauty bath as well. Lux Toilet Soap's active lather frees the pores of perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt. It's a grand way to protect daintiness. Now, our producer. We continue with The Prisoner of Shark Island, starring Gary Cooper with Faye Ray, Walter Connolly, John Carradine, and Ernest Whitman. Four days have passed since Dr. Mudd was captured, taken from the ship and thrown into a dank and dreadful hole far below sea level. Buck has been imprisoned with him. On the floor of their cell, they lie exhausted. Master Sam. Yes. How long has it been, Master Sam? Three days, I think. Maybe four. Five. Master Sam. Can you give me a little more of that water, sir? Makes you feel better, doesn't it? It cools me off, sir. I sure can use some cooler, Master Sam. I was burning up. Ain't even heard no bugles. Ain't seen nobody, no food, no nothing. Seems like everybody just gone off and left us. Reckon it'd do any good to holler again? I'll holler till I'm hoarse. What you suppose happened? I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe they've gone and left us to die. It doesn't matter, does it? No, sir. I reckon not. Feel to me like I'm going to die anyhow. Listen. There's somebody coming. Hello? Coming this way. Here we is, here. Mud. Dr. Mud. It's Major Stone. Major Stone? The commander. What do you want here? Are you all right, Mud? Well, we're alive. My colored boy here is pretty sick. Why didn't you, you send someone? Doctor, I'm here on a curious mission. I want your help. My help? Yes, I need it desperately. Doctor, this island is a pest hole. It's steaming with yellow fever. Yellow fever? The worst epidemic we've ever had. I've got 3,000 men here, soldiers and prisoners. And those that aren't dead or dying are crazy with terror. There's a supply boat lying off the island, but they're afraid to put in. Afraid of the fever. Uh, and what's this to do with me? That's what you must decide for yourself. All that I can do is to tell you that I'm helpless. There's a thousand yellow jack cases jammed in that cheese box of a hospital. And as good as dead already if I can't get a man to do something for them. And uh, what about the good Dr. McIntyre? The good Dr. McIntyre is dead. That's unfortunate. Even the just die. I know what you're thinking, Mud. And you're quite right. Everything you are thinking is true. And still, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that I can't even promise you a reward, that I can offer you nothing but exposure to death and possibly a better cell if you live, in spite of it all, I ask you, will you help me? One night, a long time ago, Major, I was a doctor. And I'm still a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Mudd, sir. Come in, doctor. How's it going? Badly, sir. When the soldiers heard about Dr. McIntyre dying, they, they all quit. Well, where are they now? They're in the mess hall, barricaded. Guards and all. But we've got to get somebody to help. The patients are all alone, deserted. Have I any authority? You give the orders, and I'll take the responsibility. Then you wait here. Where are you going? To the mess hall. You come with me, orderly. You aren't afraid, orderly? Doctor, I'm scared out of my pants. That's all right. So am I. Look, doctor. 
They've got a guard posted in the window there with a rifle. Don't you come no closer, white man. Keep going, orderly. Don't, don't stop. Steady. Stay where you is. I'll shoot again. Put that gun down. Put it down, I said. Better put it down, Zach. That ain't no Yankee talking. I think I'm going to come out from nobody. I'm not going to ask you to come out. But you're going to listen to me. I'm just going to tell you what you're going to get if you don't come out. You're going to get hanged, all of you. You're soldiers, and you've deserted your post. You've shot at your officers, and you can't get away. I still want to get away. Well, stay right here. You bet you are. And here's what they're going to do to you. They're going to take you before the judge, the white judge. They're going to try you, and they're going to find you guilty. Then they're going to take you out in the courtyard and build a scaffold. And you're going to have to build it yourselves, your own scaffold. And when you've got that done, there you're going to do some digging. You're going to dig your own grave. He don't talk like that. That ain't no Yankee just talking to hear himself talk. That's a southern man. He means it. Then the law's going to hang you. They're going to put ropes around your necks and choke you until you're dead. Dead! But for those who want to live, that want to be saved, I've got a proposition. I need help outside. Water boys, workers, boys who will do what I say. Any of you boys who are willing to do that, I promise to save from hanging. Well, what do you say? I don't know what the rest of them say, white boys, but here I is. Good. <laughs> I'll give the rest of you one minute to make up your minds. Are any more of you coming out? Yes, sir. We are. We are. We are. I don't want to dig no grave. All right. Here we is. Now part of you men begin tearing out the windows of the hospital building. Sash and all. I'm going to get fresh air and sunlight in there. You others get to soak the blankets piled over there. I'm going to wrap the sick men up and keep them wet. Until I wash out some of this fever. Now, go on. Everybody, get to work. Well, how do things look, Doctor? All right, I guess. No new cases today. Temperatures are down. No deaths? No. But wait till tomorrow. And the next day. And the next. What do you mean? How long do you think these supplies are going to last? Where's the medicine coming from? Two days from now. Out of the air? Steady, Mud. And how long do you think I'm going to last? I'm human, too. You've got to get some sleep, Doctor. You've had five days of this, and you're exhausted. And right out yonder. Not a quarter of a mile away, there's a ship full of supplies and a half a dozen doctors. And the whole United States government can't make that boat come in and help us. Mud. Will you let me put you to bed? No. I'll go myself. I'm tired. You've got to take care of yourself. We need you. All right. I'm sorry. Get a good rest, and I'll look in on you in the morning. Orderly, orderly. Get up, orderly. Oh, uh, what is it, sir? Get up and come with me. But, but sir, I... Do what I say and don't make any noise. Doctor, you're sick. Yes, I'm sick. Yellow Jack. I'm the doctor, but I've got the fever. You didn't know doctors could get yellow fever, did you? Come on. Only doctor in the world got a thousand cases. Only doctor in the world got to look after a thousand cases without medicine. Doctor, would you tell me where we're going? Yeah, here's where we're going first. There's a signalman still on duty, isn't there? Well, yes, sir. He's over there by the gun emplacement. That's just fine. Going to need his signal lights. And maybe the cannon. But what are you going to do, sir? You don't need to worry about that. Signalman. Yes, sir. You in communication with that supply ship out there? Yes, sir. Is it coming in? No, sir. The captain says it's impossible. Too dangerous in this storm. All right. Signal him to come in. Tell him if he doesn't, I'm going to fire on him. Excuse me, sir, but that's a government ship. I can't. I can't signal such a message. You see this gun I got in my hand? Well, yes, sir. You signal that ship what I told you, you'll never signal again. Tell the captain I say, come in. Yes, sir. I'll you, tell him. You boys over there, load that cannon. Yes, sir. Load it up, boys. You a good marksman? Yes, sir. You'd better be. I want the first ball dropped just close. Let's see how close you can come without hitting the ship. Oh, he'll be close, sir. What does the captain of the ship say, signalman? He says he won't come in, sir. Give him one. Close. Fire! They're putting out to sea, sir. They are, huh? Hit him this time. You can't do that, doctor. You fool. 
I've got to get that medicine. I've got to get those doctors. I've got the yellow jack, too, like everybody else. I'm sick. Someone's got to look out for things. We need help. Give it to him. I tell you, fire. That one hit the mast. He's... He's turning. He's coming into the wharf. But, doctor, what are you doing? Compliments. Major, I've just got somebody to take over my job. Catch him. Well, how's our patient this morning, Mud? Still all right? Looks like I'm going to live. That other doctor said Moss and Sam be up and around in three days, Major. Three days? Well, that'll give you time enough to get a cell ready for me, Rankin. Dr. Mudd. Uh, wait, Rankin. Dr. Mudd, I have a paper here I'm preparing to send to Washington by special messenger today. I'm in no position, of course, to speak for our government, yours and mine. But because I love the flag I serve, and because I'm jealous of its honor, I... Well, I'd like to read this letter to you. Please, sir. This is to the President of the United States. As Commandant of the military prison at Fort Jefferson, Florida, I can testify that the final checking of the recent yellow fever epidemic was the direct result of extraordinary and unselfish courage, bravery, and skill on the part of Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. On behalf of the personnel of the post, including officers, enlisted men, civilians, and prisoners, I take this means of urging executive clemency for Dr. Mudd as a reward for heroism far above and beyond the demands of duty. I, I wrote that this morning. And every man on this island will be glad to sign it. I promise you. Major Stone. Yes, Rankin? If, it, if it's all right with Dr. Mudd here, uh, well, uh, I'd like to be the first to sign it. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Freedom. A chance to prove my innocence. And I will prove it. Mama, is you coming home today, Mama? Is Daddy coming home? <laughs> yes, dear. He sure is, honey. And the President of the whole United States is sending him home just special for you. <laughs> but where is he, Mama? Why doesn't he come? Oh, he'll be here, darling, very soon. And when he comes, he... He may not look like he did when you saw him last. But don't say so, dear. Just, just kiss him. Kiss his cheeks and his eyes and, and his hands and... Listen, there he is. He's coming now, Miss Moore. He's coming right now. Welcome home, Arthur. Daddy! Daddy! My baby. Peggy. Oh, Sam. Sam, darling. Dear God, I'm home. So ends the prisoner of Shark Island. And now our stars return for a brief chat with us. Some years ago, in casting the male lead for the winning of Barbara Worth, Samuel Goldwyn gambled on an ex-cowboy, Gary Cooper, to whom he paid $50 a week. Today, the ex-cowboy is Mr. Goldwyn's biggest star, and he's back at our microphone now with Fay Ray and Walter Connolly. And incidentally, Gary, let me register my congratulations a few days early and wish you a happy birthday. Thanks, C.B. It's just about two years, isn't it, since you and I began work on The Plainsman. Mm. How is your new picture coming along, Union Pacific? We're still in the writing stages, Gary. In Union Pacific, we're telling the story of the first transcontinental railroad and the town called Hell on Wheels, which followed its progress. As the railroad moved on, the town moved with it. The houses, bars, and even the storefronts were collapsible so that they could be folded up and transported from one stopping place to the next. Yes. I know it had no laws and no government because it never stayed long enough in one place to be anything more than a roaring, lawless community. Yeah, but on each spot on the prairie where it sank its teeth for a time, a great American city stands today. And it's a coincidence, Gary, that Union Pacific also has a birthday in a few days. 
The iron horse found the end of the trail on May 10th, 1869. Hmm, that was just a few weeks after Dr. Mudd was released from Fort Jefferson. Well, not to change the subject, but it just dawned on me that Hollywood is indebted to the mosquito for three great stories. Without the mosquito, there would not have been yellow fever. And without yellow fever, the probabilities are that neither the prisoner of Shark Island or Jezebel or MGM's new one, Yellow Jack, would ever have been made. But they didn't know until 1900 that yellow fever was caused by a mosquito. Yes, for one thing, they thought it was a malarial poisoning caused from the water standing in the moat surrounding the prison. You know, they also had a dread of wet woolen clothing, believing that it, too, brought on the fever. I understand that Dr. Mudd saved several patients when he ordered a wall broken down to increase ventilation. He thought that the wind drove the fever away. What really happened was that the wind drove the mosquitoes away. And, um... May I say something else, Mr. DeMille? Certainly, Faye. Well, I'd like to send my thanks through you to the people in back of this program, not only for the grand entertainment it affords, but for Lux Toilet Soap itself. In my opinion, any girl who uses Lux Soap is showing good common sense. <laughs> that is, if she values a lovely, smooth complexion. I'm happy to tell you I've used it for a long time, and I intend to go on using it. Consider your thanks delivered, Faye. And it's good to hear you say that. You can put my P.S. on that, C.B. Thank them, too, for giving Miss Ray, Mr. Conley, and our fine supporting cast and me the opportunity of telling the story of this courageous American to the Lux Radio Theater's vast audience. Good night, C.B. Good night, Gary. Good night. Good night. Good night, Faye. Good night, Ray. Great news of next week's program comes in just a moment from Mr. DeMille. Assisting our stars tonight were Joan Carroll as Martha Mudd, Francis MacDonald as John Wilkes Booth, Ted Osborne as David E. Harold, Albert Van Decker as Sergeant Henderson, John Deering as Lieutenant Lovett, Victor Rodman as General Ewing, Lee Millar as Dr. Dr. McIntyre, Frank Shannon as Judge Advocate General Holt, Lou Merrill as Judge Mabin, Earl Gunn as Major Stone, Warren McCullum as Orderly, Frank Nelson as Prosecutor Hunter, Cracker Henderson as Druggist, Libby Taylor as Rosabel, Jester Hairston as Corporal, Clarence Hargrave as Field Boy, and Jack Carr as Sentry. Walter Connolly appeared through courtesy of Columbia Studios. His new film is Penitentiary. Appearing through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios were John Carradine, Joan Carroll, and Louis Silvers, who directed music for their new picture, Kentucky Moonshine. Now, our producer. Hollywood has produced any number of comedy romances, but few have been applauded the world over with such laughter and enthusiasm as the play we bring you next Monday night, the celebrated hit, My Man Godfrey. And we bring you not only the play, ladies and gentlemen, but the same four stars whom you saw in the picture. Making her debut in the Lux Radio Theater, Miss Carol Lombard. Co-starred with Miss Lombard, Mr. William Powell. And in addition, Gail Patrick and Misha Auer. Here's an array of talent and a comedy which together promise a great event in radio entertainment. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Carol Lombard in My Man Godfrey with Gail Patrick and Misha Auer. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Ruiz. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>